Hello and welcome to this very special edition of the Dust Morn Chronicles where we are answering your questions as well as questions that the uh, players have had for one another and questions that I've, I've had for the players as well for episodes 1 through 22. Now, uh, if you were wondering, where is my episode? I want to see my episode. What happens? Well, this is, you know, we get together, we do these recordings, and, and August is holiday season. So everyone was on holiday, relaxing and enjoying the ridiculous heats, or not, depending on what was going on. So that is what is happening today. You are getting to see a behind the scenes as we chat about some things. We take uh, a look at the first 22 episodes of the Dust Morn Chronicles and uh, yeah, get to hang out for an hour. And uh, so hopefully this will encourage you to ask more questions after each of the episodes and um, we'll um, have another one of these and answer them then. So, just to go around the group, I'm not going to waste too much time. I think everybody who watches this show knows who everybody is, but just in case, um, let's just run around the table very, very quickly, starting with Brendan. And who do you play? And um, yeah, that's that's about it. That's that's it. Question in a nutshell. My name is Brendan, and I play Dorian Duscombe, the cleric. There we go. Absolutely. Um, and so far. Have you enjoyed playing it? I've in, I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Guy. It has not always been plain sailing. It's not always been, um, you know, always at the top in terms of fun and rainbows and unicorns and ponies. There's been a bit of horror thrown in there as well. But overall, I mean, that's what we play D&D for, isn't it? A bit of tension and emotion. Yeah, there's been a little bit of tension and there's some emotion. <laughs> um, that's going on. Uh, next up, we're joined by Scott. Hello, I'm Scott. I play the character Avery, or, or the many different identities that comprise Avery. Mm. Um, yeah, and so far, it's, uh, well, <laughs> it's been, hasn't it? <laughs> but it's been a lot of fun, every single moment. You're never quite sure where the, where the threat's coming from, whether it's, uh, whether it's something that Guy's doing or something that we're doing to each other. There's always, there's always a lot going on. I feel like it's mostly what you're doing to each other. It has nothing to do with me at all. Uh, completely it isn't. Uh, yes, uh, we've got a lot to talk about with uh, Avery. Um, Avery uh, is an interesting character. Started off with quite a lot of people not liking Avery at all. Um, and some people writing, oh, the party would never do that. Da -da -da -da. And then we learn backstory and suddenly they're going, oh, it's not just it's not bad players. It's actually very good players. Because they've got backstory that actually, you know, they're following and stuff. So that's quite exciting. And then we're joined by Grace. Hello, I'm Grace. I play Georgina Flock, uh, the Barbarian. And uh, I've been having a fabulous time because I just love all the drama. <laughs> I love drama in D&D, &D, not in real life. That's stressful. But in D&D, &D, that's a nice safe place to have lots of hard hitting drama. Yeah. And and songs. And songs, yeah. Got to get in a little bit of, you know, world building. There we go. Absolutely. And then finally, we have our cantankerous old man. Uh, are we talking about the player now or the character? Or... Let's just answer the question. Let's just move forward. Uh... Yeah, <clears throat> no, that's fair. Um, uh, my name is Morris. I play Gottfried Schopenhauer, who is an Order of the Scribes wizard, human. Um. And the game itself, yeah, it's all right. No, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, I love it. I love it. I love it. It's quite fun. It reminds me of the of the games I had when I was a kid, where everybody's super invested and nobody's checking phones and whether or not to make tea. Actually, the tea would be nice anyway. Um, so yes, <laughs> I absolutely adore it. Um, the drama I find in game pretty stressful, actually, but um, yeah, it's it's great. It's a, it's a fantastic story, and it's proper. Everybody's telling the story you know yes yes i agree with you i think that that's the that's the big thing and of course i run the game as the game master and uh we've got some questions here from some folks which uh, i'm going to answer uh pretty much straight away um kampfverg i'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that uh, k4 mpfzwerg 
Kampfwerk, uh, asked the question, how precise did you prepare the map that you drew on the spot? Um, this is obviously to me. I have not prepared any maps at all ever in this entire game. As a matter of fact, apart from knowing what the villain's doing, that's all that I prepare for when I run these games. I have no idea where the players are going. I had no clue they were going to Quethlin. I never even in my wildest dreams thought they were going to be going to the Dwarvish territories. That's all on them. And uh, let me throw this out to the players with regards to that. Um, Scott, do you ever feel like you're being goaded to go somewhere specifically? I mean, how did the group choose to go to Quethlin? Well, I, I will say as well with the maps, uh, I, I can attest that even you uh, just rummaging through the, the vast chest you have of, of interesting things, you go, oh, that looks cool. And you place a big tower block and then you do two more and like, oh, that, that looks interesting. Now, now you're in a battlement and that's where we're going to be fighting. <laughs> um, this, uh, as, as a GM, I, I, you don't really, re you, you propose scenarios and, and you give us the options to take but really i do feel like we we definitely drive the decisions i, I don't feel like there, there are incentives and there's things that are definitely more incentivizing to specific characters uh like the grand library is all about gottfried that that's <laughs> so he's always very very eager to go back to the library but otherwise yeah we have so many options Mm, absolutely. Now, speaking about that library, um, Morris, you, Godfrey never got to the Grand Library. He got this close. I, he still wants to get to that library, and I still want him to get to that library. And uh, if I have to bribe you with a hundred quid or something, I want to get to the library. Um, yeah, well, he's, you know, um, he's a bibliophile, he's obsessed, and uh, yeah, he's got to knock on that door until, um, until the door falls on him, I think. Yes. I'm going to raise something that you sent to me in, I think it was a WhatsApp, where you had worked out this very eloquent rebuttal to the elves as to why you should be allowed back into the library. Mm -hmm. And I was fully expecting you to send that off somewhere around like... Oh, episode 16, when you were out at sea trying to escape from Quetlin. That never happened. What 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 happened there? Was did you just forget, or or was there other stuff going on? No, I think um, the, I mean, first of all, there was uh, a, there was the question of how I was going to get that information to the elves without, you know, exposing our location, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I didn't want to um, ask Doran to send a ascending spell on my behalf, um, for a variety of reasons. But I think the main thing was that once um, once Adri's reveal came out, um, essentially Gottfried kind of lost his shit, um, and his 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 whole plan that he'd had for forty years went out the window. Um, so his motivation at this point, certainly in this at this stage in the in the in the game, is ebbing pretty low. You know, at this stage he's a he's kind of a defeated man, and um, he will be struggling for a little while, certainly, to find some direction, I think. Mm. You know, because that, I mean, you know, 40 years of trying to restore. I can't remember where we are. Yes, restore his friend, I can tell you that. Um, <clears throat> um, to have that suddenly just evaporate, like, you know, sand through his fingers. It's, you know, it's, 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 I mean, the man's 61, you know, give him a break. Like, he's <laughs> very much set in his ways. So to have this just unravel, it's pretty devastating, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but who knows? He might, he might get his shit together. Maybe. Maybe. Now, the two characters that have... I, I, I don't want to say that have had a really well-worked-out backstory, because Gottfried and Avery have a really well-worked-out backstory as well. But when you look at the backstory that Grace and Brendan came up with for your two characters, there's a dark tragedy. And... So let me throw this to, to, to Grace. Did you know the full darkness of Doran's tragedy, of his backstory? This is episode 22, really, that he revealed a whole bunch of stuff. It was a complete shock to me. 
I had no idea. So kind of wrestling with that as a player going, oh, I don't know if there's a, any coming back from this. Uh, and then how she's feeling like to, to have Dorin as kind of her best friend from her childhood, they got estranged. They've started to rebuild that friendship. It's become something really important. They've had some really amazing like reconnection moments. And then he dies. That was fucking shit. And then we'll, the news he came back with has just just rocked her entire world. Like, her, mm. she, she's just... She's really struggling to process that, to be fair. Like, and, and I had... I had no idea Brendan surprised me with that, but uh, it was it was quite a fun, like, you know, as a player, you can go, oh, that's a juicy thing to be surprised with. Like, as tough as it is, it's still like, this is going to be some fun storytelling. And that's what I <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Like. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 the joy. And, and Brendan, how much had you worked out beforehand with, with Grace? <laughs> on, on that subject, you worked out nothing. We did a backstory where we, we came from the same location and there, there was, you know, an attack on the village and the shadow beast came along. But the, the original idea I had was that in, an, in, in that hour of need, Doran reached into some magic somewhere and, and mm. you know, Halvor spoke through him and gave him power. But then as I was going through the campaign a little bit more, this kind of horrible little idea got stuck in my mind. And I think it was around episode I think it was on the, on the ocean, I started to thought, think about like this this moment, yeah? And I have to apologize to Grace because I didn't give her any warning. But I also want to say that the what, when I've read some of your comments, you know, you are watching this video now, like the amount of respect I see towards Grace acting out this reaction is just phenomenal. And I just feel like if anyone can pull off this like indignation, this anger, this raw emotion it's it's an actor actor like grace right she mm. pulled it off incredibly so so i'm sorry but you've also <laughs> had some fantastic moments with it so i'm not sorry I mean, as well you, you set me up for some great moments and i appreciate yeah. that so thank you yeah. i think the general commentary is that everybody has had a just everybody has had enough time to be able to do their own thing and express their own stuff as well it's not like anybody isn't in the headspace of just solid role playing, um, you know, maybe not in the same episode, but in different episodes, we've just got these things that are coming through. So let's talk a little bit about the character design. And I want to start with Scott. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? What were you, yeah, thinking? What were you thinking? What, what were you thinking? So the characters that I'm always really attracted to. Attracted to um, are complicated ones, and I don't want to. I, I don't want him to come across as fully selfish because, but he definitely is self-centered. But it's it's hard to balance that uh, when you're playing with other players, and you have to make it work uh, in a group space. You can't just you can't just do you because you're you, man. And everyone else will have to figure it out later on. Uh, so it's good to have such a good group of players that we we kind of even unspoken um, speaking arrangements as we play, we know what what the group needs to get on with. And um, there's a there's definitely a line that you can kind of you can take with that, and still push to do your own uh, put your own agenda on it. But it actually works for the group. It's not just taking everyone for your ride. And being really selfish it's it, it but it's it's still posing that as as like a, well mm. i'm self-centered this is this is what avery wants to do <laughs> yes but when it came to the uh, the design there's there's two characters that that i had in mind um from fiction there's the vertigo comics john constantine he's a sort of spiritual uh spiritual private detective kind of thing uh, he goes out fighting, fighting ghost crime, <laughs> mm, mm. in a way, very occult based. And then there was also the very, very flawed character. Um, is one of my favourite uh, stories 
by Joe Abercrombie, uh, the, the the first Law trilogy. There's a character called, uh, oh my goodness, uh, Nicomo Koska. He's a mercenary, and he's off the wall, um, struggling with alcoholism, mercenary. Uh, that is incredibly fun to read, uh, and I, I like I like fun characters who are just incredibly they're, they're self-centered, but they they're just they have a charm about them, and uh, I hope that comes across. But it can be difficult. <laughs> I think we've definitely seen a growth happening. Yeah. Um, as Avery was plucked from the shadow fell um, after a rather impulsive grab of an innocuous item uh seemingly innocuous anyway uh, morris talk to me about how you and scott came up with the idea that godfried had done things to <laughs> to avery um where, where did that come from do you remember do you recall how the two of you kind of said hey let's work out this relationship i don't remember the details that there was I, I couldn't tell you who thought of what because there was a Hmm. There's a lot of to and fro. Um, I mean, I started with Godfrey just being um, an, a grumpy old man. Um, decided he was German for some reason. Then I thought of um, the grumpiest man who has possibly ever existed, with his, which is the real Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, my favorite line of his is, uh, the world is hell and men are either the demons or the tormented souls in it. Fairly hmm. pessimistic dude, you know? So... Um, <clears throat> That's what he started, and and as as for the the idea of having a, a kind of a um a pawn that he was manipulating, taking care of, that just kind of developed, and I, I think it just kind of fell out of our heads, each prompting the other. And and um, uh, as I say, at this point, I couldn't tell you who thought it, precisely what. Um, but it's, <laughs> I think it's working out in a fairly interesting way, you know. I'm very curious to see where it goes. Mm. Because if you recall episode two, which was the set in 20 years in the future, Avery was willing to betray the entire group to the evil in exchange for learning his true his true history, which he's now got. Mm. So it's it's already changed, changed the future uh, dramatically. Um, but where Avery's going to go with this information, um, once you know that pesky little thing like the center army has been dealt with I think could be quite quite interesting now something that we haven't seen we've seen a relationship between um, Georgie and Doran we've seen Gottfried and Avery and there is a bizarre relationship from my perspective between Doran and Gottfried and that stems from a singular uh, point of contact, isn't it? Or have I missed something? Brendan? Yeah, I mean, you know, in in our backstories, you know, Doran works for the church and Morris works for the wizards, right? And um, <clears throat> I, I always imagine ourselves when I think about our characters at the beginning, a little bit like Indiana Jones. And who is that baddie who is always running off trying to steal all the stuff ahead of Indiana Jones? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yes. It belongs um, in a Belloc. museum. Belloc. 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 Yes. Exactly. And I imagine, I imagine that we, we kind of have this relationship that one of mm. us, we're both going after the same thing, mm. but for different motives, right? And, and mm. Doran was trying to suppress the, the knowledge of, 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 mm. of stuff in the world and Gottfried was trying to kind of get it for himself. So I always felt that we had this kind of dual purpose in the world somehow. Mm. And it, it, it didn't start off great, right? I mean, Gottfried and his mm. biblio, bibli, you know, bibliophile approach got us into hot water very early. I'm talking about uh, mm. episode six, when we were escaping through the crypts mm. and Gottfried had a wonderful moment when he he grabbed the skeleton or the lich, whoever it was, and said, give me the books and the whole hell yeah. broke loose, right? And um, later on in the episodes, you know, Doran came back and, and you know, told Gottfried he, he didn't like books precisely because he had you know done something very bad by reading a book he shouldn't have read mm. so we have quite a similar mm. path in life a little bit but we're approaching it from very different angles the friend of me thing that you said at one point is, is kind of sums it up you know yeah. um, we would have been at loggerheads the kind of faith versus reason thing uh, in yeah. lee and then we've been kind of grating off each other for the for the entire campaign really 
and we're yeah. trying to come to this understanding because we know we kind of need each other. Yes, you know, I did um, hold out a laurel branch for you though, didn't I? Um, you did, on you the did. Boat. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I sent a message to Arthur Dust Warden to save those books for you. So yeah. I, yeah. you know, I think Doran does does see that yeah. there, there can be a value in this relationship. Yeah, um, and, and Godfrey definitely has has softened his his. You know, he yeah, his prejudice would have been this is this is this kind of um, closed minded person that that you know mm. it only deals in 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 faith and and prejudice and stuff and yeah. and then you sweeten him with some books. You know, that's that works. <laughs> <laughs> Just give the man some books; he's going to love you. Well, the big one we still have to find, of course, is the Crepuscularium. So yeah, I think that's, right. that's going to yes, feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the proper pronunciation. Thank you, Chris. It, it yes. did take me a long time and a lot of practicing to make sure that I could say that without sounding obscene. Um, <laughs> so there is that. Uh, Grace and Avery. Uh, Georgie and Avery, I should say. Grace and Scott. Um <laughs> Georgian and Avery, there have been some interactions, mostly with Georgie being disgusted <laughs> at Avery's attempts to educate a certain princeling. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly been something she's been dealing with. But I think she's definitely she's grown to have a bit of a soft spot for Avery. And especially with the most recent like mm. thing going on, uh, I think she kind of like there's team betrayers which i would uh, call dorin and uh, gottfried and then there's team portrayed avery and uh, georgie yeah so. oh, i wouldn't have seen it like that i think that's very interesting what do you think about that scott yeah yeah definitely there, there's room for sides on a debate um <laughs> uh, who who screwed who over hardest um wow. and like what we're gonna do man, <laughs> You know, we, we could form a little gang, um, maybe even include the prince in our revenge against the two of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the prince that was abandoned to a dwarven shopkeeper and then abandoned to a vampire spawn. I would say that Avery kind of thinks of himself as this nurturing father figure and is doing it in very Avery fashion, which is <laughs> absolutely awful. <laughs> yes, I, I, I remember a certain scene of, uh, I think it's in episode seven, um, Avery trying to teach the prince how to use a dagger properly and Grace having to take it away from both. Yeah. Um, room for development. Yeah, yeah. Room for like, development. he'll need to learn at some point. You know, yeah. he, does need, he does need these skills, but parents have just been killed in a really horrible way, so... Yeah. yeah. That's very true. That's very true. And that is something that's hanging over that is a promise of the parents being brought back, mm. um, which is going to be an interesting one. I'm looking at you, Avery. Well, it's, um, it's nice that you have the, the, that sort of dichotomy of, of what happens when you, you leave a child alone with like a terrible uncle versus <laughs> someone who, <laughs> who's a lot better at being nurturing and understanding of the situation. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Very true. Very true. All right. This question comes from No More Telecom. Um, I think it's directed specifically at uh, Godfried. Um, this is actually from, I think, episode one. Uh, is enema damage the one you're vulnerable to from the age of 60 and higher? <laughs> um, I would like to think that most of us are vulnerable to enema damage. I mean, it's a it's a delicate spot, right? Uh <laughs> But, you know, I haven't done the research. Okay, uh, okay, fair, fair. I don't know. Certainly, <laughs> if I get through the campaign without suffering any more enema damage, I would be very grateful. Yes. Uh, no spikes yes. in that direction, please. Um, That's right. That's I right. don't think I'm weird about that. I don't think I'm peculiar in that respect. I think most players <laughs> would say, could we go easy on the enema damage move? You know? <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to step away from being the curator of enema damage expertise, if that's if that's possible. There you go. There you go. Simple request. You'll forever Simple be known request. as the enema guy, Gottfried, so don't worry about it. Yeah. 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 Listen, well, some parties merch. in Berlin still. T-shirts? T-shirts? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could get merch of, like, uh, yeah. branded donuts to sit on. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure that'll be very popular. <laughs> well, let's move swiftly along and try and elevate this conversation let's do upwards. That. Um, in terms of game choices, so so um, these are some tough questions. I will throw this very first one to uh, Dice of Destiny. Uh, says that it is to Grace first. 
What's been the most difficult decision your character has had to make thus far? Off the top of your head. I mean, go. first thing I'm going to say probably is deciding to take the prince with her from the elvish city. Ah. Because, yes. you know, from her point of view, maybe, maybe the somehow the parents have been brought back to life and maybe I am taking him away from safety and a good opportunity, but she just kind of had to go with her gut and she just didn't trust them. So yeah, sure. Let's make an enemy of a whole city of really advanced elves. That's a yes. great idea. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That was uh, episode 15 and 16 where there was that decision to whisk him away. Yeah. Um, and what what interesting consequences happened as a result of that? You folks decided, hey, we're going to go to the dwarves because that's where we can go. There was a lot of debate about whether you should go to the dwarves, to the Kabalia, to go back to Houghtonley, uh, to go somewhere completely different. Um Brendan, what do you think sold you guys on the dwarves? You gave us a lot of options in that episode, mm -hmm. Guy, and um, man of them sounded horrific. <laughs> I think you were describing some man-eating lizards mm -hmm. and, yes. some, uh, and some gnolls who had a kind of a, a penchant for mm -hmm. violence as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think mm -hmm. we viewed the, the, the dwarvish territories as kind of neutral territory where we might be able to lick our wounds a little bit and the fact is that also, I mean, Georgie and, and Doran were, were from the Dwarven um, territories. And we, we had even in our mm. back pocket that this might be a safe location to lay low for a little bit or potentially even leave the boy there for a bit. Right. Maybe mm. sequester the Alexander in, 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 uh, in, in our hometown for a bit. So I think it was a combination of let's go and take stock a little bit and figure out what next to do without going straight back into the fire. Because and one thing I'll say about this campaign guy that you have you have done exceptionally well is just i mean the pace of this thing right and the consequences after consequences and everything moving forward and there's never a dull moment you know i i, I enjoy watching dnd podcasts and i like watching downtime this doesn't have a lot of downtime right it's really mm. it's really go 100 percent. yeah i mean you were supposed to have had downtime in quetlin um yeah, no. Uh, but there was a thing that happened, a couple things that happened, as a matter of fact. I mean, once you got out of the Shadowfell, you could have had some more downtime. But, um, so, yes, I completely agree with you, though. Uh, in terms of, of the pacing, it really is breakneck speed. Um, in retrospect, the Dwarvish territories, are, are they still sounding as neutral and safe as the other ones? I kind of feel like cannibal lizard folk, at least you know where you stood with them. Um, so, um, right. This one is to, it's got to be to Gottfried. Uh, can you recall a moment where your character's choice surprised even you? Does that even happen? Do you get surprised where you're like, oh my God, this is what Gottfried would do. And I've got to do that. Or, or are you um. calculating the whole time around? That feels reasonably predictable, but um, I suppose, for example, re you know, reaching for the the whatever it was, undead creature, and and uh, almost ca uh, causing a party wipe. You know, the, the extremity of his, of his addiction, so to speak, um, did surprise me a little bit, I suppose. Um, but more more than that, I think that it's it's occasions when Godfrey isn't quite such a pain in the arse that's that's surprising. You know, when he is. This, tiny moments of of um of either compassion or compromise or um <clears throat> let's just you know go easy on being a pain in the arse for for two minutes and, and do something you know useful um i think my my greatest surprise is that he got out of the shadowfell that's nothing short mm -hmm. of a fucking miracle right mm -hmm. 61 year old man goes to shadowfell mm -hmm. comes back in one piece you know that's 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 a claim to fame, I think, you know? Yes. The Shadowfell, I must admit, was one of my big surprises <laughs> as a GM. I mean, I, I constantly am surprised by, by the choices that you guys make. Um, not in a bad way, just an, oh, that's cool. Oh, they're going with that. Oh, that's what they're rolling with. That's what they're doing. That's how, they, that's how they're running it. Um, but in the Shadowfell, I, uh, I, I remember very, 
very specifically. Um, I think it was it's, it's notes here are if episode fifteen um, or fourteen. Uh, if you're wanting to go and rewatch these moments, but when you were negotiating with the the Chuck and trying to 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 work out the symbol that you had seen, um, I was. I thought being very heavy handed with the clues that I was giving out, but apparently I was not um, because of what you guys decided to do, which then just turned everything on its head um, and drove it in a very different direction yet again. Uh, and, and that to me was a moment where I, I, I was just gently reminded that as a GM, you might think that you're being quite heavy handed. But to the players who have got a thousand other things going on, it's absolutely not obvious. Um, yeah, so, so, so I, 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 that was that was one time I must admit, I was I was quite surprised. Uh, and there were other times where I wasn't surprised. I was goading Godfrey to to grab the skeleton in the book. I was like, I've got to put more in your way. I've got to make this more complicated. Um, I've got to drive that point home. Um, so, so I, I don't know if I've spoken about this before, but if you remember that library that you were you were running through, um, and folks, you'll you'll see you'll actually see it in the episode episode six. Um, I drew a little river in the corner of the room, and that river was meant to be a get out of jail free card. You guys were supposed to follow that river out into the the port where you'd organized that ship. But you were more interested in the books and no one sort of looked at that river and it was an opportunity for me to go, all right, fine. I will use it as a pressure point. And that's why then it started to flood. But it, at first I drew it onto the map going, well, this is how they get out. Um, and when you, you didn't take it, I was like, well, okay then this is how i make it worse it's starting to flood i'm going to put some more pressure you know and, and then that drove you elsewhere which was just as exciting we got to meet that wonderful little old innocent couple mm. um so so yeah um anyway decision right is, dare i say it a, a great gm <laughs> uh, well i don't know about that i don't know about that but uh it's it was desperate perhaps so it's like uh, come on we've got to we've got to up the game here um right brendan how do you balance making choices that are true to your character with those that are beneficial to the party i, I will answer that question in a roundabout way right because to preface this a little bit i will say my normal type of character is a geezer I like to play dirty, horrible goblins, half orcs. Morris, when we when we played together for the first time, we had a lovely little dirty geezer duo. We were playing at guys' table in D and D in a castle, right? That was where we first played together in, in as a as a th as a thruple, if that's a word. Um, <laughs> but you avoided threesome, which is probably a good thing. It's actually from Grace's podcast, right? Oh, the thruple. Right. It's a, it's a form of relationship that uh, okay. you know. <laughs> okay. If you're open to. So, uh, so yeah, we had a throuple in the D&D in a castle. And, um, yeah, I normally play geezers. And this time around, I thought, you know what? I'm going to play a serious character. And I must say that it has been, like, exponentially more challenging as a player to toe this, this kind of serious line, especially when those around you are being rather chaotic often and rocking the boat. And you're coming back to your god and your center and the reason you're here. And um, so it has been a challenge, Guy, to kind of keep true to that because my instinct is often to you know, rock the boat a little bit. And I think towards the, towards the end of the, the, the series we're talking about, so towards episode 22, you can see that Dorian is starting to be, have a few more darker kind of uh, decisions placed in front of him. So for instance, you know, one of my most challenging decisions was the Damnifer discussion when, when, he was, when he was killed. And I have agonized over that guy because I, I didn't know if I made the right decision, right? If, if Doran would really take that deal, but, you know, in the moment when the pressure is on and you're, you know, Damnifer said, time is running out, dear Doran. 
and you know that you've got to make a decision quickly and you know your friends are dying in the other world, he made this kind of very rash decision. But I will say that, that if, you know, Doran's center is, I think, in the right place, but he, the way he weaves around the center is, is what makes playing the character quite fun as well. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Lovely answer. Uh, Scott, have there been any in-game choices you regret? <laughs> oh, God. Hmm. Let's start. <laughs> but in, in truthful... Uh, truthfully, no, not really. Um, hmm. Everything that Avery does uh, is kind of the antithesis of Doran. It's how do you how do you hold <laughs> how do you not rock the boat too far that you can't come back? <laughs> how do you not quite go beyond? And Yes, that there have been times where I felt that was that was pushing it a bit far. I think I think one decision I I kind of regret just out of sympathy for you guy off the cuff was um, when I decided after I came back at the beginning of the session that it just kind of hit me. Oh, I can completely change. I have an opportunity to just change my class and not tell anyone, and then just start using a different class's abilities, uh, and just see how Guy deals with that. I don't think I would have had, been comfortable doing that with any other uh, any other GM. So, I hope you see that as a compliment. <laughs> um, but then the it's kind of how how can I. How can I play it without going too far? I I, I don't want to be irredeemably assholeish. <laughs> mm. Absolutely. Okay. So, 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 you... so uh, yes, no regrets. There you are. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, right. I'm just looking at these questions here. So let's step away a little bit from the characters. Let's talk about more about the people behind the characters. Um, do you do anything to prepare for your for your session are there any um, pre-game rituals or anything like that um and i would say this is to anyone who actually does do any kind of preparation anyone i mean lots of, sure. yeah. lots of coffee <laughs> <laughs> you drink lots of coffee before we start playing yeah. we start playing at like 10 in the morning yeah. um so <laughs> i like to put my dice in order like yeah, that important. pleases me yeah put them so yeah. that the highest number is facing up and put them next to each other and stuff but uh, i tend to do that more for uh more ordered characters that i play for georgie it's a bit more chaotic dump mm. the dice on the table but in other games it will be a bit more prim and proper if the character is more prim and proper i Fair. think because avery um especially originally the way that that specific type of bard works with a different uh, summoning the different characters through him i was looking at what voices or what character i sometimes have to remind myself um <laughs> because you've got a cockney sort of avery and then you've got the more well spoken uh, uh, uh which uh, there's too many in my head mm. <laughs> the fan the fan favorite um what's his bloody Alphonse. name Alphonse. 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 Come on. that's the one but then, which I'm now Avaradus as well. There's too many A names yeah. floating about at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I need to, before a session, I might just need to like sit down, and just kind of mm. focus. Okay, which character is which, and which is which voice? Mm. Mm. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And for me, you... guy, I mean, I'm relatively new to D and I've only played it for a couple of years, so so I'm I'm unfortunately quite religious with my notes prepping. And um, I have a whole kind of system prepared that I, I have kind of ambitions for this for this session, motivations. What is the current status of my relationship with each of the other characters and key NPCs? And I have this all in front of me, and then I don't follow it at all. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I've done the preparation, therefore I feel prepared. And yeah. um, Guy, as you know as well, I'm sorry, man. I mean, I, I, I send you reams of ideas for things that can or cannot happen and you very politely say oh thank you for that brendan that's very nice and I, it's never <laughs> seen again <laughs> i know about... i'll go through the 26 tab excel sheet he's just sent me that's no problem <laughs> <laughs> uh i don't think that we they are never seen again um i did i did enjoy very much the fact that um 
before we'd even started the campaign, between you and Morris, you had already worked out about four different variants of campaign that we could be running, um, which you happily shared with me. And uh, I do remember getting it. You know, we'd played together at D&D in a castle before, but not only once. Um, and I thought, OK, well, they're very enthusiastic chaps to try and tell the GM what, what campaign he should be running um, based on their ideas for a certain book. Um, but it was lovely because it's inspirational. And you look at that and you go, OK, actually, those are pretty good ideas. But I can't just take them straight off as as written. I've got to somehow look like I'm doing some work. <laughs> um but um, yes, everything that you send through does get read, it gets absorbed and, and it gets stored away so it can get used at specific moments. Uh, generally when it's the most tense um, and at the worst possible time. But uh, yes, that is, that is I, I really enjoy that. There's, there's, there is quite a bit of sort of banter that goes on behind the scenes in, in, in that regard. Uh, right, this is a tough question. Uh, let's start with... Um, gosh, let's start with Grace. What do you enjoy most about playing D and D with this group? Ooh, um, well, I enjoy how much I've. It surprised me how much I enjoy playing with this group. <laughs> I think that might sound really weird, but like I was coming into this really not knowing any of you. And the first time I've played in a game where I've been the only girl and I've gone, oh, what what am I letting myself in for? Is this going to just be a load of royal rules lawyers telling me I don't know how to play D&D because I'm a girl or, you know, I had no idea. I was just like, what if this is an awful, horrible situation? I was completely uh, nothing like that at all you are all just the most sweet and loveliest guys um you all make me laugh a lot i feel like i'm very looked after it's like having a big old gang of brothers and um and we get to play games and it's just it's really gorgeous so my favorite thing is you lot really oh that's sweet <laughs> sorry i'm a mushy girl <laughs> <laughs> oh girls make me happy <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting that you say that i do think that um we often have these sort of preconceived ideas and things um and often they don't work out scott what what do you like about playing D D with this this particular bunch there's just so much creativity from every single person it's like an endless wealth <laughs> and at any given moment that there's so much to play off of of any any aspect of, of each other's characters uh, there's just there's so much going on <laughs> mm. and i just feel so comfortable playing with you guys because you all just feel so um like honed in on, on what you're on, on who you are in, in when we're role playing you it just comes so naturally to all of us uh, like at the beginning it was almost intimidating i was like oh crap these guys are really really good <laughs> okay let's see let's see where this goes and as it's gone on it's like okay wow we we really just I think we're just really in sync with just, and we know that we can push each other as well. And we do push each other yeah. <laughs> and we throw each other under the bus. Mm. Um, and those are probably some of the most fun moments when we're throwing each other under the bus. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. uh, Morris, where do you think that that trust sort of comes from? I don't know. Um, I think, um, you know, there's an immediate atmosphere when we're sitting down, everybody's there for, for a bit of fun um somebody said to me the other day when they're watching it's it's like it's not like a bunch of people trying to put on a performance it's just a bunch of mates having a having a really nice game of D, &D. to me it's, it feels like a bunch of kids in a good way everybody's really invested and everybody's there for the fun and there's nobody tut tutting or or um you know this is not how you should play or any of that stuff everybody's letting everybody do their thing um so i think we, we kind of all just kind of know that from having played together we know that we're all in the same kind of headspace in terms of what this game is about. We're just here to have fun, you know, um, and um, <clears throat> and I think it comes across, you know, certainly the, the, some of the uh, comments I've had from mates and stuff, it's like, you're just a bunch of mates having a game of D&D &D and it's lovely to watch, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Brendan, what do you think contributes to, to, to the atmosphere around the table? Well, first of all, I think the, the in-person experience is great. You know, I, I like talking with you all here on Zoom, 
but sitting down and you know constantly having Morris's bony elbows <laughs> sticking into my side and having to push him away like all the time and, and being burned by the sun you know <laughs> these, these, these are these are all like real experiences yeah um so I mean I guess what I, what I really enjoy most about this group guy is that you know we all we all take time out typically on a weekend you know some of us travel from far afield some of us come with their families down to the studio and and you know we're all making an effort to come and do it together and I, I think that every single one of the people around the table and this includes you guy as as the GM bringing it all together you have so many strengths in in creativity and role play and improvisation and I think and we've proven it over and over again repeatedly through the story when you know something's hit the fan we get through it and back to my point earlier like I would I would not throw you know this horrible plot plot twist at someone like Grace if I didn't think that she would just pick it up and hit me in the face with it and she did it it was like I was I was, you know, I was so shocked by her performance, but I was smiling. I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that, that, that's what I think really makes this thing work, Guy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, um, right, so um, we've got a little bit of time left. The future. And bearing in mind that when this episode airs, we will have already played about oh, eight or nine more episodes. Uh, maybe 10 or 11, actually. What do you think is going to happen in the future? Now, you guys have got an extra four episodes, which you have already played. So put that aside. Moving forward, what are some of your thoughts uh, in terms of, of what's going to happen uh, in the future uh, to paint a picture you've got the centaur battle the centaur army thing you've got alexander um where or what do you hope would be the outcome um let me throw that first to uh grace oh no <laughs> not me um gosh i yeah i mean as georgie she's thinking what on earth are we gonna do like how how can we defeat this massive fuck off army um and as a player i'm thinking well it's a game so there must be some way to go in the right direction at least right uh maybe um i what i would like to happen is i'd like us to get some allies I'd like us to get some allies that have more power than we do and try and go in a direction that is going to be a good future for Alexander because ultimately he's a kid that's had a lot of rubbish just happen to him and Georgie knows what that's like and she wants him to have a better future than what it looks like he'll have right now. So I think that's, that's what's important to me and Georgie. Hmm. Very well said, I think. Brendan? Yeah, I would, I would, I would jump on that as well. I think that's a great, great um, sum, summary of what what can and maybe should happen. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I'm, if I think in, in long term, you know, Doran imagines that this might be a, a kind of continental, like upheaval, right? There might be some wars going on as we are playing through this campaign, and I don't think that we need to be involved in all of them. I think that politics will happen and that some, you know, the gnolls might attack these and the gnomes might do that or whatever, and we are kind of this elite force maneuvering between the, the core hotspots um, where we're needed. And I can imagine, Guy, that it might end up being some type of surgical strike deep into the Shadowlands to, uh, you know, get to the big bad, whoever he is, you know, um, mm. and somehow get into the Crepuscularium, somehow working with that, eradicating the darkness and getting the hell out of the Shadowfell before it goes that's what I think might happen, but... Okay, okay. Gottfried? Um, similarly, I've, I've been thinking, first as a player, that yes, this is a kind of... Um, this is a global phenomenon. Um, and Gottfried, certainly in the place he's in at the minute, he's... he's essentially, his kind of um, bordering on despair thing, given every situation... is underscored by... The, he feels entirely overwhelmed. He's like, I'm, I can't... I'm a scholar, I can't take off. I, take, I can't take on an international arm, an international invasion. Um, so right now he doesn't have a very good sense of where things are going to 
go. Um, what I want more than anything else is level seven. No. Um, I think it would be nice to see, uh, you know, all these four characters who all have quite different concerns, finding some common thread, not just in, in terms of we're going to win, but something that will unite the four characters um, and make and put them fully on side, whether it's OK, we can't think about this anymore. Things are too important or. Uh, or what is what is probably more would be more interesting is that they they all come to an agreement that by way of compromise that there's one direction for them all to follow that would be kind of nice mm -hmm. if it's possible now that's another question scott what do you think avery's hoping for or yeah none or achilles or ajax <laughs> or whatever the hell you want to call yourself <laughs> there's you... there's a lot going on and it, it kind of boils down to, to three things really there's our own interpersonal problems which <laughs> seem to be overshadowing everything at the moment there's the immediate threat of the centaurs and then there's what does this mean for the wider global scale so we do have our own little private channel that guy doesn't have access to and we sometimes just throw ideas at each other like, what do we think we're going to do just as players um but it's quite interesting because because mixed into all of that is each of our characters and, and and trying to get them to not pull in different directions because we we do have these chats outside of also away from the table where we think of things that might work but then when you get down to it our characters quite often like avery was very very eager to get involved with the uh, the vampire nation <laughs> offload the prince get one responsibility gone maybe get a few allies there but that's a, a very morally not not maybe not even gray it's tilting toward the <laughs> darkest shade <laughs> but, it's not that bad. yeah so exactly so i feel like there's some there's some conversations we can revisit there <laughs> in the light of more recent uh happenings I yes. feel like uh, yeah. Georgie's not one to be able to make commentary on the vampires considering Captain Charles there was some there might be a, a contest for a certain captain's affections going yeah, on there yeah. Georgie, Georgie is somewhat um, uh, yeah she's, she's, she's interested in Captain Charles and she's confused because I, she's not sure if she's a uh, being more trusting of her because she likes her or not or <laughs> we'll find out yeah and it will be interesting to see what happens when alexander discovers this because uh yeah mm. we'll see we'll see mm. we'll see all right let's uh address the elephant in the room very quickly the crepuscularium this great tome of whatever mm. uh laughed at by the elves as a fictitious work derided by the university of the humans and Howden Lee as a folly of Gottfried. Um, what does, does Grace know anything? Uh, does Georgie know anything about the crepuscularum? Literally what she heard when we were doing that interrogation. That's all she's got. <laughs> she can't pronounce it. She just, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, something that they're interested in so yeah it's a bit beyond her at this point anyway yeah and avery there's all sorts of things that avery does and doesn't know about this book um and there's more that he knows than that has been revealed or that he doesn't know as well and we're going to find that out in the future hopefully maybe sort of yeah i think at this point <sighs> He doesn't know the relevance of it, and, and he might even have his own idea, especially with, with more recent... <laughs> uh, we, we're at the point now where we've died and come back, haven't we? So the re-signing of a deal, the the reveal of, a, of mm. who he used to be, is the cupuscularum as important to him as it once may have been? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Yeah. You have made a deal with the devil to hand it over as soon as you get it. Uh, alas. 
<laughs> You're talking about Avery here. Mm. I wouldn't I wouldn't trust a deal with Avery <laughs> as far as you as could throw it. Spit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um Godfrey the Crepuscularium has been your MacGuffin since character creation. Where did that come from? Um so crepuscular just means pertaining to the twilight. Hmm. Um, there was a Twilight theme going on in, in the whole thing. Um, and I wanted um, Godfrey's obsession with books to be about something in particular. So uh, as far as, so without giving anything away, um, for Godfrey, this is the answer to everything. Um, hmm. primar primarily his, his guilt with regard to Everard Malebranche. Um, but um, I've tied it in a little bit to the Order of the Scribes thing. Um, so Order the Scribes Wizards, and they're all about their book. The, uh, and you'd have heard Gottfried from time to time say the ideal is the real. So the idea is that with, with magic, with words, he can make certain things happen, as wizards all do, but this can be at a grand scale. So for him, this is a kind of a, a one-stop shop to fix everything. Um, mm. Now, the trouble is, he's never actually had it in his hands. So he's, he's basing all this on research secondary texts that tell him what the contents of the Crepusculaarium are. Um, obviously, it's to do with a certain understanding of Twilight, one that Doran would really not like. And um, I'm going to say any more, uh, don't give anything away, but basically, um, yeah, for... So one of the reasons that Godfrey is, is rather crestfallen is that he believes that somebody's already got it. Shydath already has this book. And as far as he's concerned, if that's the case, game over. Because he thinks this book is so powerful that if somebody like Shydath has it, especially if Shydath is this mysterious kind of uh, leader or king of the Shadowfell, it's game over for everybody. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's an mm. interesting one. And, and, and Doran, do you see Doran going into the Shadowfell again? Because I can see Godfrey saying, well, we've got to go and get this book from the Shadowfell. Would, you, would, would Doran go back there to get it? I think Doran is quite um, single-minded now guy and mm. i think i think that um you know the twilight order know of the crepuscularium because it was you know it's mainly godfrey's thing and the twilight university is a stone's throw from the twilight sanctuary in, in howden lee so it, it's definitely one of the books of interest and they what they don't know too much about it other than that it's it, it's purported to be incredibly dangerous and it contains heretical um language mm. um and I think Doran will make the leap of logic there that if it is so dangerous and it does in fact exist, it cannot belong in the hands of someone like Shydoff. And by the way, Guy, thanks for dropping that Shydoff bomb in episode 22 when uh, the minion outside the pit said mm. that his master's, master's name was Shydoff. Mm. And Georgie and I were like, Crap, we had him in our hands, <laughs> literally. And what is with that, by the way? If Shiloh is this big global king, why was he in a Questland prison sitting on his hands? I don't know. So many questions. There. Yeah, something there. Don't know what exactly. That's a lie, I do. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I think, yeah, all the secrets, all the secrets. We've come to the end of our time. I I have to just very, very quickly, um, if you could sum up this game in one word, what would that word be? And I'll I'll start because it's it's not an it's not an easy one. We haven't got through nearly all of the questions that we've put together. So uh, if you like this, if you like this kind of format and you want to see this, not every single week, obviously, but once in a blue moon, let us know by hitting that like button or leaving your comments down below. Our, more questions are always great. If you've got burning questions, you want to know things, put them in the uh, comments down below. And remember, throughout all of the episodes, you are welcome to put your questions as you're watching the episode. And we'll compile another list of questions and answer them as we have done here. So if I were to put this campaign into a single word, I would have to say, hmm, I would probably say that this entire campaign is about, or the campaign is trust. 
It's all about trust and the betrayal of trust and the giving of trust and the withdrawing of trust and entrusting um, one another or, or losing trust. So trust for me is, is one of the pivotal things that this whole game so far has been running on. Um, anyone got any other words that they, they could think of? Um, that, that When they say this campaign, you go, what's this campaign about? You're like, well, it's about this, it's about that what one word. I'd go for, I say it's layered. Layered. Oh, there is yeah. so much stacked in this game yeah. from everybody around that table and yeah there's a lot to peel back absolutely absolutely any last thoughts i was going to say secrets and also secrets, secrets on it in terms of the internal thing everybody's got secrets from each other and we're look chasing after secrets mm. but yeah. from the player's point of view from my point of view the word that describes this and, and, and playing this game is sheer, well, that's two words, joy. Just joy. <laughs> joy. 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 Absolutely. Joy. All right. Um, any last, uh, Scott, Brendan, anything to add there? Otherwise, uh... I was going to say, yeah, to, to build on Grace's point, interwoven. <laughs> right. Interconnected. Uh, there's yeah. so, there's layers between each other. There's things that guys just constantly coming up with, but that just build upon each other and build upon the world and it, it, it's a testament to your world building that that it all just comes together so well that you're able to just bring it forwards uh, each little moving piece on your little chessboard even though i we all know that it comes from it comes from nowhere sometimes it all feels like it's just connected <laughs> Well, in truth, the campaign world has been in construction for 15 years, so I yeah. know it pretty well. Yeah, yeah. But what's happening? Well, that's a different story. Anyway, last thoughts from you, Brendan? Yeah, yeah no, I, I would say that it's it's full of drama, okay? It's, it's a big, happy, full wrecking ball train wreck of drama. And, you know, the name itself, Dusk Morn Chronicles, I mean, these are, these are heavy words. They give a certain feeling. Before I sign off, guy, I just want to say that we did toy a second toy with a second uh, title for the for the for the show, right, Morris? What do we call it? We want to oh, call yeah. it. Oh um, yeah, Godzilla comes to Braxia and it kicks the son of the dick. I mean, <laughs> it's great right. working title. Back really in the second name, right? second series. Really good. <laughs> Well, there you go. Thank you so much to my wonderful players for joining me this evening and doing this recording. Thank you to you for watching the show and for all of your wonderful comments. Uh, keep them coming. And I hope that those of you that have kind of made comments going, oh, this was stupid, this was dumb, this didn't make any sense, have now started to see that most of the time it actually does make sense. It's just we don't know why. Um, and so that's something that I have been constantly amazed by is these decisions. You go, why the hell did you do that? Well, because my backstory, this happened to me when I was five and you're like okay that is that is amazing that's absolutely amazing until next time from me and everybody here i just want to say goodbye <laughs>